Hello everyone, this is Bella. Today I want to talk about Jared Hansen, the movie that just came out, and I have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot to say. So I'll start out with a spoiler-free section and then I'll go into spoilers and I'll warn you before that happens. So I, I saw this in theaters, I so I don't have much footage. This video is probably going to be more like scraping together whatever clips and photos I can find, but I, I have I have a lot of thoughts. And I'm pretty familiar with the musical. I'm really familiar with the songs. I've seen it in person once, so I do know about the original story a little bit. I'm not like a super fan of kind of the dialogue and that kind of aspect. I know the songs really well, but I only saw it once. So yeah, go into it knowing that about my background with this material. So first I want to talk about the cast and characters. And first off, let's start with probably the most controversial part of this film, Ben Platt, who played Evan Hansen. So I do... I mean, I, I just, I really love Ben Platt. I'm a fan of his. I think he has such a beautiful voice. It's literally perfect. He's so talented. He's never sounded bad. Any performance that I've seen from him, from even when the it was just announced that the movie was kind of starting to be produced a little bit, I was hopeful that Ben would be cast, but I was, I was open to other actors as well. There's plenty of other talented people who could have played the role. Andrew Barth Feldman, Stephen Christopher Anthony, Jordan Fisher, Andrew Barth Feldman, who played Evan on Broadway for a while, Stephen Christopher Anthony, who played Evan in the touring production, Jordan Fisher, who took over for Andrew on Broadway before everything shut down. And Jordan Fisher has a lot of TV and movie credits, so he also has the film experience to bridge the gap between stage and screen. So I, I definitely didn't think Ben was the only person who could possibly play Evan, but there is just something that's special about being able to see the original person that created the role, just seeing people from the original cast in general that have that connection with it. And as someone who never got to see Ben perform the full role of Evan, I just have the recording to appreciate and, you know, various performances on the Today Show or whatever, I did really want to see him in the role. So all of that to say, I'm definitely a little biased towards Ben. I'll get into the age thing more in depth later, but for now we're just going to talk about his performance, completely ignoring that aspect. So Overall, I thought he was pretty great. I mean, the singing is obviously great. No one can take that away from him ever. The one issue that I had with his performance was I felt that his awkwardness was a little bit over the top for me. It just felt like too much. It felt like he was acting, like he was playing he was playing this geeky, awkward character instead of just being the character. And at first I thought this maybe had something to do with the transition from stage to screen. I mean, he played this role for years on stage, so obviously he's done a lot of training and practice performing in this certain way that reads well on stage. But I was looking back at some of his performances from back then, and even then it doesn't seem like he's as over the top as he is in the movie. And... There's a lot of places where that could have came from. Maybe the director or whoever wanted him to be more over the top. Maybe they thought he was doing it too subtle. So they told him to camp it up a little bit, but I it just didn't really work for me. And I think a big part of this disconnect was also... It has to do with the humor, I think. Like, I think the awkwardness was played for laughs. Like, his... His, he does this word vomit thing. He just, he keeps talking over and over and, it, and over and it's too much and it's not making sense and he just keeps going and going and that's supposed to be funny and that's what they do in the stage version too, but I just don't think it worked well the way they did it in the movie. 
So I think that was a big part of it as well. If the -the over-the-top awkwardness isn't funny, then it just draws attention to how it's too over-the-top. But one thing I do think he really excels at is the low points. He's really great at crying and breaking down and really laying it all out there. It feels really raw and vulnerable and emotional. He definitely, he goes all out in a way that I don't think we see ever really. On a writing level, I also didn't like the changes made to Evan's character. In the stage version, I think Evan has a lot more personality. In the movie, he's just this depressed, sad, awkward kid. There isn't really anything else there. And I think the more energetic version of Evan that is shown in the stage version might help contribute to audiences thinking of him as a villain, which is a problem that they tried to solve in the movie version. So I I think that might be why they made his character more muted in the movie, so that audiences feel bad for him and sympathize with his choices. The movie as a whole took it too far with the realism, and I think that was another reason why they made his character more bland and realistic. But I think overall it just made him more boring and made me relate to him less, because I didn't think of him as a fully realized character, because he pretty much just had one emotion the whole time. And it's hard to watch, too, because it just contributes to the overall heaviness of the film and how the movie is so overwhelmingly depressing all the time. The stage version, I feel like he has more to his character, so there's there's some funny or energetic moments that we can enjoy that juxtapose all of the heavy, sad moments. So next I want to talk about Caitlin Deaver as Zoe Murphy. And I was definitely skeptical of her when the casting was announced, mostly because of the singing. She is not known as a singer. But I I thought she did a fine job. Her voice definitely isn't as strong as Laura Dreyfus's, but I, I thought she was pretty good. And she definitely has the perfect look, too, I think. And the, and the acting was fine, too. I was happy with that. Now I want to talk about Colton Ryan as Connor Murphy. I think Colton Ryan was a great fit for this role. I'm glad they had another person from the Broadway cast in the film. And I did like this portrayal of Connor versus other versions of Connor that I've seen. The version I saw and the original Broadway version, Connor is more of a grungy, scary looking guy. And Colton's version is a little more normal looking, but then with some gothish e-boy elements like the dark clothes and the painted nails. He's he's more edgy than scary here, I thought. But I, I definitely wish we would have seen more of him in the film. He kind of disappears in the middle to the end, which is unfortunate because he's kind of the central idea of the film. So I think the film kind of loses itself by losing sight of Connor. So Amanda Stenberg as Alana Beck. This is another person I was skeptical about when I heard the cast announcement. Again, because she's not known to be a singer. But her solo songs that she had, I actually thought she did a really good job. I didn't really notice any weaknesses in her performance at all. But one thing that I really did appreciate about her performance was I feel like she usually plays a more popular, confident girl, or at least that's how I see her in real life. She seems really comfortable with herself and her body, and I could really see the way she changed when playing Alana. She seemed more like a real teenager, slightly self-conscious and awkward, So I I thought that was really great. Amy Adams as Cynthia Murphy. So when the cast was first announced, I thought it was so weird that Julianne Moore was playing Evan's mom and that Amy Adams was playing Connor's mom. I saw it perfectly the opposite way. Amy Adams being Evan's mom and Julianne Moore being Connor's mom. But in the end, when I saw the movie, I actually, I thought this was cast perfectly. And... 
Amy Adams, she she fits the look really well, and she is an experienced singer. So I, but I do think they underutilized her talents there a little bit. She only sings in one song, but I thought her performance was so great. She's so good at playing this suburban stay at home mom that's kind of going a bit stir crazy, and she's still functioning, but she's in denial about what happened. And you're able to see all of these layers in her performance, the mother, motherliness, love, compassion on the surface, but the hurt hiding behind it all. Danny Pino as Larry Mora. I know a lot of people were worried about the change from father to stepfather, and I didn't mind it. I don't think it really mattered to the story at all, but I think he was really great at playing this father figure. He's this really traditional dad character, strong and masculine and commanding, but then has those few moments where he's breaking down. This is a really great show about mental health awareness, and it just seems like younger generations these days are much more prone to anxiety and depression, and they're just more open to having these conversations, and I think shows and movies like this help coordinate the conversations and make it seem more normalized. So this movie is really important in exploring themes of depression and anxiety and self-harm and suicide and grief. And specifically a message that I particularly resonate with in, in the show and in the film is just the idea of making sure that you know that you're important and that You know, even if you're not famous, you're not popular, you still matter to someone. So I I like to talk about the range of what I felt while I was watching the film. And something I think they attempted was comedy, which I don't think quite worked. It wasn't awkward and cringy. Like, it didn't feel like they were trying too hard or anything. But it just wasn't effective in making me laugh, which is kind of unfortunate. I think it would have helped break up the heavy subject matter in the film. But so as I was saying, this is dealing with heavy subject matter, heavy themes, a lot of crying and grief and messing up and mistakes. So there isn't much room for comedy or fun, but I I cried so many times watching this movie. It's definitely a lot. So there... There are good things and bad things that come with that. I I always love a movie that's able to emotionally affect me like that. I just think it's so cool that this, you know, this fake story is able to make me feel such strong emotions about it. But that's also what makes it hard to watch because it is a task to get through. So I don't think I would rewatch it very much just because it is so heavy. And I just want to mention this one scene that gets, oh, it, get, it gets me so bad when Connor's mom, Cynthia, is talking about how she got a suit and tie for Connor since she, her and all the moms were talking about bar mitzvah season. And, you know, bar mitzvah season is just around the corner and, you know, he's going to be going to a party every week. And then she says that Connor never got to wear the suit because he never got invited to any parties. And oh, that it's just so sad. It just, it gets me. I I love that line. As for the plot, there, there was something that felt off about the structure of the story. And I think part of it was how the songs were moved around. So in the stage version, the exposition is given through anybody have a map and with that song removed the exposition is now made in waving through a window which doesn't quite work the same or in the stage version words fail is probably the climax and then there's not really much that happens after that but then here they do words fail and then there's quite a bit of story left after the climax. So I think something about the structure just felt a bit off. And if I wasn't already familiar with the story, I think I would have felt a little bit like, what's the point of the story? Where are we going? 
So I, I think that was a little off to me. I want to talk about how effective this film is as a musical. And I think a big problem that it has is that it's too grounded and realistic. And I do think the source material is also grounded and realistic. So they did have to work with that. But I think they took it a little bit too far. The stage version has a little more fun with it. Um, I don't think the film, it didn't take enough risks and it felt a little bland. And I think there are kind of two types of musicals. There's the realistic musicals and then there's the more fantastical, colorful musicals. And there are the fantastical musicals like Little Shop with the singing plants or musicals like Hairspray, which even though it's a realistic situation, it's, you know, civil rights era, even though it is real in that way, it still feels campy. It feels over the top, colorful, over dramatic, idealistic. So there's those kind of fantastical musicals. And then there's the more realistic musicals with things like My Fair Lady or Oliver Twist, where the tone is more grounded and the characters feel more real and the plot and situation is more attainable and relatable. And I think these realistic musicals have to work a little harder to keep our attention. And there's and there's a lot that they can do with memories or dream sequences that I think was a really big missed opportunity in Dear Evan Hansen. So Dear Evan Hansen doesn't have any dancing. It's pretty much just singing. That's pretty much it for the musical elements of it. And I was hoping that we would get a more exciting visual interpretation of the songs in the film. But for the most part, we literally just watched them sing in their room for three minutes. It felt like such a huge missed opportunity, very uninventive. And I'll get more into specific examples when I get into the song breakdown section. But as an example, in the stage version, we get more conversations between Evan and Jared or Evan and Connor as a kind of figment of his imagination. And in that way, we're able to see more of these side characters and understand who they are. And also under get to, we get to know Evan a lot more, too. We get to understand his thought process. And it's just more interesting to watch and to see them interact. So I... I think the makeup was a little bit heavy on Ben. I think everyone else looked fine. So I do think they were trying to overcompensate for Ben's age, which ended up making things a lot worse. And people complain about the hair too. I don't know what else they could have done with the hair though, because I don't think the stage version of hair would have worked. I think the stage version hairstyle that Ben had, I think it looks dated now and also would have just made Ben look his age. And I think part of it is the is the blue polo that makes him look so old because there were moments that he was wearing other stuff and I thought he looked more believable as a teenager. But other than that, I don't really have much to say about costumes or makeup or sets or anything. So now I want to get into the specific controversy of Ben's age. And this is going to be a little bit of a rant for me. So this is this is probably the biggest controversy of the movie. Is he too old to play the role? And yes, I think he looks older than a real high schooler, but I don't think that completely precludes him from playing the role. I think we can all agree that he he looks older than a real high schooler. But people are taking it way too far, saying he looks 40 and all of that. It's just, it's way too much. I'd, I don't think it was that bad. Yes, someone the appropriate age would be best, but usually you can't have everything. You have to choose. You have to choose whether they perfectly look the part, whether they have chemistry with the rest of the cast, whether they can sing, whether they can act. There's a lot of things to consider and you can't have everything. So in this case, I'm just glad that they cast someone who could actually sing. We're lucky to even have that in movie musicals. For me, I think the priority would be 
in a musical, the priority would probably be to act and then sing and then dance and then be able to look the part. So I'm, I'm fine with it. My issue is when people act like this is a huge deal breaker. People are acting like this is the first time this has ever happened in a movie. Like it completely ruins the movie, ruins his performance. It's like people have never had to suspend their disbelief before. And in the end, I almost wish that Ben wasn't cast because I feel like that's why everyone hates it so much why people won't even give it a chance. It's distracting people from being able to appreciate something that's really beautiful and has a really great message. And it's just hard when I've loved this for years and now it's mainstream and I was hoping everyone would love it as much as I do. And then this happens and people won't even give it a chance for a pretty lame reason. And it's just, it's just frustrating. So... Before I get into the spoiler section, I want to give a little recap in case you're going to head out now. So I I love the musical, so I'm definitely going to rewatch this again at some point. I think the movie is a little hard to watch, though, just because of how heavy the topics are. So I don't think I would come back to it consistently. And I, I did enjoy it. It didn't quite meet my expectations, but I did really like it. I like the cast. I like the singing. I like the changes to the story for the most part. My biggest problem is how the plot structure was changed and also the song performances in terms of visuals and staging, which I think all of that mostly came from this goal of trying to make it feel more realistic. And I definitely would recommend people to see it. I think most of my issues come from comparing it to the original. And if you don't know the original, I don't think you would pick up on as many issues as I did. And I'm also, I'm easily able to overlook Ben's age if I don't think it was that distracting really at all. And I mean, if you don't like musicals, don't watch this and then say it sucks when you automatically hate everything that's a musical anyway. And if you can't see Ben's, if you can't see past Ben's age when playing this character, don't watch the musical and then say it sucks without giving it a chance on all of the millions of other things that it offers. So I'd give this a 7.5 out of 10. So now I'm going to get into spoilers a little bit more. So first I want to talk about the tree part at the end, (laughs) the twist. I I really like how they visualized Evan's memories and flashbacks to that day in the forest. I I mean, I think they could have done more. They could have had different shots than just the same one over and over. But I I like how they kind of kept coming back to that that moment how he broke his arm and it was very Stephen Chbosky. It was very Perks of Being a Wallflower where we kept we keep getting these flashbacks and you wonder why they keep coming back to this moment. And then in the end, you finally realize what it is and it all comes together. And is it's just so emotionally impactful once you, once you put all the pieces together. And I really like what they did with the end. I personally didn't have a problem with the original ending, but I know a lot of people did. So in the stage version, Evan reveals everything to the Murphys they take the blame and that's basically it. And then it ends with Zoe visiting Evan in the orchard. And I think a lot of people saw the ending as Evan getting away with everything. He does all these terrible things, but then he doesn't suffer any consequences. And I disagree. I think that he does have plenty of consequences in the stage version. It doesn't really have a happy ending. I at least left with a bit of an icky feeling that he messed up, that he'll never be able to take back what he did, but it at least felt a little bit hopeful that everyone is moving on with their lives and everyone's learned something at least. But I did like the movie ending better. I think it takes things a step further. The Murphys plan to keep the secret as in the stage version, but Evan takes accountability and owns up to it and releases a public statement 
And I like that they specifically tell us that the Murphys are going to take the blame because the mom is worried that Evan might hurt himself. So I'm glad that we know that they didn't pressure Evan at all. And he had the possibility of letting it go like that. But he took full ownership of it and told everyone he was lying. I also liked how after all of that, he did try and learn more about Connor and how he got the video of Connor playing guitar. That moment was just so moving and touching. And there's that one moment where Connor's mom says that Connor apparently played guitar, but no one ever heard him play. And then that Evan's able to get this video of him playing in the end. I just really loved that. I think there were also subtle changes in the film that made Evan's decisions seem more understandable. I thought the film did a better job than the stage version at showing why Evan makes the decisions he does and also almost forces him into this bad decision a bit more. I've only seen the stage version once, so I may be misremembering things, but I feel like the film is better at showing Evan almost being forced to make these bad decisions and him being forced to do these bad things makes it easier to feel bad for him as a character. So I think that helps people who watched the stage version and left thinking that Evan was a really bad, irredeemable character. So as an example, I feel like Connor's mom was pushier than she is in the stage version. In the stage version, she also does jump to conclusions and think and hope that Evan was Connor's friend. But I feel like in the film, Evan would say multiple, multiple times that he wasn't Connor's friend and Cynthia almost didn't want to believe it. And a specific example is in the dinner scene where he sings For Forever. Cynthia asks Evan to tell the family a story about Connor, and Evan initially refuses, but then the family devolves into this huge fight, and then I think Evan says something really vague about a tree, and the family just lights up. Oh, you must be talking about the orchard, and they just go on and on about the orchard and old memories of going there, and they all just get instantly happy and Everything is like it's fixed. So Evan gets this instant feedback and this positive reinforcement that the lie is important in helping them grieve and helping them remember the good memories with Connor. So then he sings for forever and he just goes all in on the lie. And another example is in the stage version, I believe Evan is the one who creates the Connor project. And in the film, Alana creates the Connor project and asks for Evan's help. So I think this makes it a lot easier to understand how he got trapped in the lie. He, was, he wasn't eagerly building it and pushing it further and further. He, like in the stage version, how he creates the Connor project and is inserting himself in the story and keeps going. In the, in the film, he's more com just complacent and is just trying to avoid confrontation. And I also think the film is just better at having us understand his perspective and what he wants more. I think it does a better job at making us understand why Evan is so vulnerable to this situation and what his goal is in doing all of this. So the film is able to show us where his gaze lands, what he's processing, there's all these picturesque, ideal moments with the Murphys that are juxtaposed against his lonely home life, and it's easy to see why he likes this new life and why he keeps the lie going. As an example, he plans Taco Tuesday with his mom, but he comes home and there's a note from his mom saying she can't make it and needs to reschedule. And you can just see the heartbreak on Evan's face and feel the loneliness of the house for a person that is already so hopeless and alone. And then he gets a text from Zoe that he's invited over to their house for pie. And he comes over and watches Zoe and her parents prepare the pie and joke and play around. And it's the perfect nuclear family in this perfect home. 
and it's easy to see why he's drawn to this. I want to get into the songs and performances a bit more. So first I want to talk about song changes from the original version. So the film takes out four songs, Anybody Have a Map, Disappear, To Break in a Glove, and Good For You. I love Anybody Have a Map and Disappear, but I would gladly get rid of those two for them to also get rid of To Break in a Glove and Good For You. I really don't like those two songs. They're always a skip for me. So Anybody Have a Map. I think getting rid of this song was a pretty big mistake in the movie. I think, for one, it's just one of the only exciting songs in the musical. I think it gives good energy as an opening number. It introduces the whole cast and some of the problems that the characters have. And we understand what the kids are struggling with and how the parents are struggling to understand their kids. And they're trying to do what's best for them. I think this also would have been another time to take advantage of having Amy Adams in the cast since otherwise she only sings one song. And I think this also did a lot of damage for the structure of the plot. Disappear. There's a lot of similarities between Disappear and You Will Be Found and the songs happen right after the other, so I can definitely understand getting rid of one of them, and You Will Be Found has been the theme song of Dear Evan Hansen, so they definitely weren't going to get rid of that one. So I understand completely why they cut Disappear. I personally like You Will Be Found better musically, but Disappear is almost as good for me musically, and I like the message in Disappear slightly better, but all in all, I was okay with this being cut. To Break in a Glove, I think this one was done much better in non-musical form. The song is just, it's kind of boring for me. And I just liked the film version having Evan and Larry talk it out instead. And Good For You is the last one that they cut. I never really paid much attention to the song. I never connected to it musically, so I was fine with it being cut. But I did like the little Easter egg, though, where the marching band is playing the song at the pep rally assembly at the beginning. Okay, so first up for the songs that they actually did have in the musical, Waving Through a Window. On the outside, always looking in, will I ever be more than I've always been? Cause I'm so the film opens up with this number. I don't think it's a terrible song to open with. It's definitely upbeat, so it brings a little bit of energy, but I think Anybody Have a Map would have been a much better choice. But I think this song is also a little odd where they placed it because it's kind of the I Want song of the musical, and I don't think it's very common for musicals to start with the I Want song. I think it would be better to learn a little bit more about the character, about the world, and supporting characters and their dynamics with the main character before we go into the I Want song. And as I said a little bit earlier, I don't think they took full advantage of visuals. This is a more realistic, grounded musical than most, so there isn't much to see. It's literally just Evan singing in his room, and that's literally what they show us. It's just him singing in his room. They don't show us maybe what's happening in his mind, what he's dreaming about, what he's thinking of, anything more interesting than him just singing in his room, which was just, I think this was a huge missed opportunity throughout the whole musical consistently. And all of this combined, I think, leaves for a bit of an underwhelming opening number for forever. All we see is sky for forever. We... So since they cut Anybody Have a Map, it leaves a pretty big gap between Waving Through a Window and For Forever. I'm not sure how long it was, but it, feel, it felt like it was about a 20 minute gap between songs, which is just, it's too much of a gap for the beginning of a musical. 
And this song, again, just showed him singing around the dinner table for most of the song. Toward the end, it does show him imagining Connor helping him up after his fall, which is a really touching moment that I'm glad they included. And I like the idea of Evan almost starting to take comfort in this retconned memory. Like, what would have happened in that moment if I had been friends with Connor? But I think it would have been way better if we could have seen the picture in Evan's head of the story he's creating of Connor and him on this adventure. So again, I think it's just a huge missed opportunity. Sincerely me. Dear Evan Hansen, we've been way too out of touch. Things have been crazy and it sucks that we don't talk that much. I think this number came off very bland. It's such a high point in the stage version. It's, this is a pretty depressing show, and this is one of the few fun, lighthearted moments that we have, and I think this was played down a lot in the film, especially in the beginning of the song, and again, it just comes down to it being portrayed so realistically. So especially in the beginning of the song, it's literally just Connor walking down a hallway. And there's so many different ways that they could have shown this. They could have shown it more like the stage version where you can see Evan and Jared almost puppeteering Connor. And that way it's more clear what's going on and it's just more fun and entertaining to watch. Or like the line, if I stop smoking drugs and then they revise it to crack and then pot. Why don't they show us all of these different portrayals of Connor doing these things rather than him just walking down a hallway every time and saying the line differently every time. It wasn't bad. It just, again, felt like a missed opportunity. And if I hadn't already known the source material, I don't know if I would have known what was going on. I don't think I would have been able to follow it at all. And so this song is about Evan and Jared making up these conversations, trying to make the conversation sound natural and like it's the appropriate friendship level. And I feel like maybe in the film version, they just didn't pause enough or enunciate enough for us to understand all of the going back and forth and who's saying what. So it was this, this number was pretty disappointing. Requiem. I always just love the idea of this song, a song with three members of the family and how they all sing the same chorus, but with completely different meanings and emotions and intentions behind it. And specifically in the film version, I really loved the part where it shows them trying to live their normal lives after this huge life event. Zoe walks down her high school hallway and you can see everyone staring at her, whispering about her, pitying her. And then you see Larry walking through the hallways of his office and his coworkers awkwardly watching him, not knowing what to say. And then Cynthia walking through the aisles of a grocery store trying to live her normal life. And I just loved this interpretation and this is something that they could have done with the other songs also. Show us something other than them literally just sitting there and singing. If I could tell her. He said, there's nothing like your smile. Sort of. I'm really glad that they didn't kiss after this song. That's already a big improvement for me. I just, I just have a general comment about Caitlin Deaver's singing. Her singing is definitely not as strong as Laura Dreyfus's, but she is able to hit the notes and sounds good, sounds passionate according to the situation. She's not the strongest singer, but she's perfectly fine. And I'm glad that it seems like they left her vocals pretty raw. It doesn't sound really auto-tuned or anything to me. And I think that her more realistic singing voice, it just... it lends to the story or the film feeling more realistic. And I think that this number did a better job than most numbers in the film 
of actually showing us what they're talking about, showing us Zoe's jeans with the stars on them, showing us the indigo streaks in Zoe's hair, showing us how Zoe dances, and also showing us that these memories are from Evan secretly watching her and being kind of obsessed with her. The Anonymous Ones. There's this little moment after the sunny smile as their eyes fall to the floor. This is one of the original songs for the movie. They usually add an original song to movie musicals these days, and you can usually tell which one it is because it doesn't fit in and it's never as good of a song as the other ones. But I think this one fit in very well. It fit in just, it felt like the same vibe as the other ones. And it also just, I think it was just as good as the other songs. And I was also pleasantly surprised with Amanda's performance. She sounded like she was singing well to me. And I liked that she also didn't sound really auto-tuned. You will be found. Dark comes crashing through. When you need a friend to carry you And when you're broken on the ground I never liked the talking bits in this song. It sounds so outdated, like they're trying to force this emotional impact when I think it's completely unnecessary. It sounds like early 2000s surfing the internet lingo, and I just hate it so much. And I was hoping that they would take that out of the movie, but no. Visually, I also hated the bit where they took all the pictures and made it into Connor's face. And if I can't find footage of it, you're probably not going to be able to tell what I'm talking about. But all of this kind of thing is just playing into this old, outdated perspective of internet being this black void and cables and zero one, zero one. And it's it's just so weird. I don't like it. Life. Especially now. Giving us a space to remember Connor. Cyberspace set free. Hello, virtual reality. Interactive appetite. Searching for a website. A window to the world. Got to get online. Take a spin. Now you're in with the techno. I did really love the moment where Larry comes home from the office and he just breaks down. And it's just so effective to see this man who has been strong this whole time finally face what he's been repressing only us i don't need you to sell me on reasons to want you i don't need you to search for the proof that i should i did notice a few wonky notes on caitlin's end and but i mean overall it was fine and this is just an this is another one where we watch them sing to each other in their bedroom for a few minutes. Toward the end, we get to see them actually go out and do stuff, but it takes a while to get there. Words fail. I never thought that it would go this far. So I just stand here, sorry, searching for something to say. This one, I think, makes sense to stay in the house and focus just on the people and their emotions and reactions because the real feature here is Ben's performance. And again, I mean, this is just the standout for him. He's just so vulnerable. He completely breaks down and cries and yells like it's the end of the world because it is a complete rock bottom moment for Evan. And this is what Ben does best in the film is he really just lays it all out there. So big, so small. It was a February day When your dad came by before going away I never really understood the point of this song, to be honest. And that's definitely on me. I'm, I'm just someone who pays more attention to the way the song sounds rather than what it actually means and what, what the lyrics say. But maybe it was the way Julianne Moore performed it that drilled it into my head a bit more about why the song was included. 
I think at times Julianne does more talking than singing, so I was able to focus more on the lyrics. So I just, I appreciated kind of being able to understand the story a little bit more, a little closer. Well, today, today, what felt so far away feels a little closer. I really loved this moment with Connor playing guitar. I thought it was a really moving moment. And again, this was another original song, and I thought it fit in really well with the existing songs. The one thing, though, is that it kind of replaced Finale that is in the stage version. I liked the original stage version. Finale has a kind of reprise of For Forever, but with a different context at the end. So that's the one thing I don't like about this song is that this is the one that they reprise in the end. So that's it for the song breakdown. I just want to summarize everything again now that it's the actual end of the video. I, I did really like the movie. There's definitely things that could have improved and it's not perfect. They could have done things a lot better, but I think they did a pretty good job. The cast is great. The source material is great. I like most of the big changes they made between versions, but it does feel like they weren't very inventive and didn't take many risks. So that's it for my thoughts on Dear Evan Hansen. Let me know your thoughts on the movie. If you know the stage version, what you thought about the changes from stage to screen, what you thought about the cast, uh, let me know. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.